Prior to its introduction, the Mustang was an unknown entity, and its success was uncertain. It was just another nameplate in Ford's vast stable of legendary models. But similar to a foal that runs soon after birth, the Mustang was galloping like a proud steed immediately after the starting gate was dropped on Friday, April 17, 1964. Now the Mustang is an icon, a brand in itself, and this is the Ford Mustang at 50. The story of the Mustang, like most cars, began with a sleek and futuristic concept, followed by a running prototype. Then came a production concept, which was transformed into the very first Mustang. Fifty years is a long time. It's a significant achievement, a milestone to be remembered, one not to be passed up like other ordinary mile markers posted along the multi-lane passages in the corridors of time, but to be reflected upon, appreciated, and celebrated like the special roadside attraction it is. After all, 50 only happens once.
For weeks and weeks, Mustang clubs met to discuss, plan, and prepare for the Mustang's big day. Literally thousands of Mustang owners representing hundreds of clubs from around the world took to U.S. roads and headed for either the celebration in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway or in Charlotte at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Five decades ago, the Ford Mustang stood atop the Empire State Building, and on April 17, 2014, a special crew repeated this feat by disassembling a 2015 Mustang, transporting it to the 86th floor observation deck via elevators during the night and reassembled it before dawn. The week-long celebration featured automotive stars like Gail Halderman, the man who drew the first Mustang, Vice President of Ford Design, Jack Telnack, the stylist of the Fox Body Mustang, Vice President of Advanced Product Creation, Neil Ressler, the father of the SVT Mustang, Cobra, and Cobra R, and Chief Engineer Art Hyde, who directed and developed the fourth and fifth generation Mustangs. So when I graduated from high school, I enrolled at the Dayton Art Institute, majored in industrial design. The instructor there was a fellow by the name of Reed Meemeister. And before coming to Dayton, he just designed a Tucker automobile. So we did some designs on TVs and power tools and everything, but we also did some cars. And he encouraged us to get in the car business. And I took his lead and went to Ford Motor Company. And I was hired at Ford by uh, Gene Bordenay in 1954. I was 21 years old. And the uh, first program I worked on was a 57 Ford with Joe Orris. And uh, he designed it. I just did what he told me to do. The original car had three taillights, individually. But because of timing and cost, we could only use one bulb, had to be one bezel, so we had to design it to look like three. And in 1967, we did the three taillights. I, we knew we nailed it when we saw Iacocca out there looking at the car and twirling his cigar. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and we, of course, we knew him from week to week, and he always would look at what we were doing, and if we saw that twirl, we knew we were doing pretty good. The engineers came with a list of 65 items that uh, I violated the uh, Ford standards on. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we changed uh, three or four of them, simply because they liked it and they didn't want it changed either. Now one, one of the biggest problems was the bumpers. We violated the bumper standards like crazy. And if we had put the Ford standards on that car, it would have been awful. Well, thank you very much, John, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed an honor to uh, have the opportunity to speak to uh, this group of Mustang enthusiasts uh, <coughs> and have the honor to uh, talk about one of my favorite products, uh, John, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think it was a bit brief, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, make, we'll make do of it. Thank you.
I guess I should tell you a little bit about my qualifications too in the first place. Why, why should uh, a guy like me have an opportunity to design the iconic, an iconic car like a Mustang? Well, I was born in the Ford Hospital in Detroit. <laughs> my father was with the company, the Ford Motor Company, for 38 years. I attended college on a Ford scholarship, and then Ford uh, hired me right out of college and uh, brought me in to design the first, uh, uh, my first job. And I think I couldn't draw a Chevy if I tried, so that really, <laughs> really cemented the whole thing. But I, um, before getting into the 79 Mustang, I'd just give you, I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, how I started uh, in the Mustang program. I actually had an opportunity as a 25-year-old designer to uh, work on the um, first Mustang. That was Joe Horace's project. Joe Horace was the executive of uh, Ford Studio at the time. And I worked with Joe and Gail Halderman, who's here, who you all know. And I actually had an opportunity to um, do uh, some of the sketches. Let me see if I can get these up here. Well, these are a couple of the sketches that I did. I don't know if Gail remembers these or not. I think he, he uh, may or may not have used some of the uh, ideas here, but uh, this was the sketches for the first Fastback Mustang. These were done in 1962, if you check the date. And if you look at the rear end of uh, the sketch up there, you'll notice that there's a slight kick up in the deck. And that was not on the first Mustang Fastback, uh, but it did uh, finally make its way to the 68 Fastback, has a little kick up. But there's something even a little bit more unique about that sketch, and that is the lettering. I don't know if anybody can read the lettering underneath that pickup on the rear end, and it says Cougar. You're right. And I'm, I'm sure most of you know now, after hearing some of these presentations, that Cougar was the code name. You may recall that the motoring press, uh, when the car was introduced, the motoring press described this car as being very European. I don't know if you thought it was European back in 79 or not, but a lot of people did. And there was a very good reason for that, fuel regulations, because fuel uh, was very expensive. This is a picture of me in the studio in Ford of Germany. We're working on cars, a clay model there. And uh, we were uh, told to do, do something to improve the fuel economy of these cars. Well, the only thing we could do in design, since I don't do the powertrains or engines, we leave that up to Neil and his engineers, uh, we felt we made a significant contribution to this car uh, to these European cars, I should say, uh, through the use of aerodynamics. As you know, fuel was really expensive. It was expensive in this country. It was much more expensive in Europe. And it was our only opportunity, and I think a very important opportunity, for a design to actually contribute to the uh, fuel economy of the car. And this all was done in the wind tunnel. Needless to say, this had a lot to do with the shape and form and the contours of the vehicle. But it did give the cars, uh, obviously, a very functional European look. There were a lot of people who were against the idea of replacing the uh, Mustang by uh, the Mazda-based car. In some people's views, the Mustang was yesterday's car and the Mazda front drive car was tomorrow's car. Uh, but there were a lot of people who were against that. And they did, myself included, we didn't view it as an either or. Which, and it ended up being that we did both. But uh, the argument sort of fell into two categories. One was emotional, uh, that some magazine organized all of these, this letter writing campaign, and they came in by the barrel for it. I mean, it was incredible. But there were also logical arguments that were advanced, and I was more on that side of the equation, trying to say, we don't need to make this choice. The Mustang wasn't doing well financially. I thought we could fix it. I didn't see any reason at all to throw that away and start to hit, put all of our chips on a front drive car. It was a nice car, it turned out to be a success. Different people, the, the, the people who were gonna buy the Mustang and the people who were gonna buy the, what came to be the Pro were completely different segments. There was almost no overlap. And my argument to the people about me was, no one is gonna cross shop those cars. Somebody who comes to look at a Mustang is not gonna look at a Pro and somebody who wants a pro is not going to look at a Mustang. So why are we making this choice? Let's do both. And uh, I wasn't the only one. A lot of people 
uh, raised that objection and uh, raised that argument. And I think the logical argument, together with the emotional argument about all these letters and all of the things that came out in the magazines about how stupid it was to walk away from a brand that is really Ford. <laughs> Then and even today, the Mustang and Ford go together. Why would you throw it away? Thankfully, for all people like me, uh, we didn't. So, kept the Mustang alive. So, it's, it's a great thing to be here. And this is really to celebrate a car, right? But is it really just a car? I mean, it's really, Mustang is a symbol of many things, right? It's, it's a symbol of self expression, it's a, a symbol that you can do anything you want to if you're determined. It's accessible by everybody. It, aren't those the core values of the U.S.? So you can go around, you can go to Thailand, which I've had a chance to go to. You can go to uh, uh, India. We've never sold Mustangs there, but we have Mustangs. There are Mustangs there. There are people here from uh, Norway and Sweden. My uh, first touch with Mustang actually was the 64 World's Fair. My family was not into cars. They weren't into engineering, anything like that. My father was a, an accountant. And uh, so we, I, you know, we went to the New York World's Fair where he had spent a lot of his uh, uh, growing up. And um, I just fell in love with the car when I was waiting in line at the rotunda to get our, get our turn. And when we got up to the front of the line, of course, there was some big car, I think a Galaxy or something like that. And we just kept waiting. We let people, two or three people go by, and we finally got in a Mustang. And that was actually the first car I ever can remember sitting behind the wheel of. And it was a great memory and stuck with me forever. And to be honest with you, I went to college, became an engineer, and I, uh, with the goal to be the Mustang chief engineer, to be honest with you. And I, I wrote letters to Ford. They didn't record, recruit at my college. So I uh, read, wrote a lot of letters, and I was able to get into the company and um, uh, through with a lot of uh, help from a lot of good, good mentors. Um, and my first project was actually the 79 Indy Pace car. The engine actually on that car. For 50 years, buyers have been attracted to a vibrant kaleidoscope of Mustang models. During that time, the car has become much more than a machine. More impressive than the millions of cars sold around the world, or the 3,000 movie and television appearances since 1964, the narrative of the original pony car is just as much about the people as it is about the machine. Proud Mustang owners around the world are who make up this colorful, powerful, and swift tapestry. Even championship-winning NASCAR team owner Jack Roush, finally known as the Cat in the Hat, is a Mustang owner and enthusiast. He, too, was preparing for the 50th anniversary celebration, and on the day of our interview, Jack's P-51 Mustang arrived in grand style. The vintage World War II fighter plane was placed on display along with 50 Ford Mustangs owned by other enthusiasts, which were all parked in front of Jack's hangar for the special event. Yeah, my story with the Mustang really starts in 1964. I graduated from Berea College, Berea, Kentucky, in in May of late May of '64. The first of the first of May, the, the last week of April, the first of May, I bought a Mustang based on seeing that one drive down the street in front of me and picking up a brochure from the local Ford dealer that didn't have a Mustang on display. He sold us two Mustangs that he'd gotten initially uh, in the first uh, week that he had them. And uh, I worked my way through college and uh, had, had enough money left over, I had all my college bills paid, and had enough money left over to buy myself a new car and establish myself in the workforce. And I had a choice of, of going uh, to, to the military, joining the Air Force, they wanted me to ride in the back seat of an F4. I wanted to be the guy up front with my hair on fire, so I didn't do that. And uh, the other offer I had was Ford Motor Company. At uh, by the first of June, I made the decision to go to work for Ford. By the first of July, I was relocated in in uh, in, in Michigan with my new uh, car, and I was w working as a surveillance engineer in, in, in between the automotive assembly division and the plant, and I was working at the Mustang plant in the uh, Dearborn Assembly uh, in, in Dearborn, Michigan, where they were producing the Mustangs. Ford had uh, built the Fox Platform Mustang uh, for several years, and in the late 1980s, they decided to replace that with a front-wheel drive car that they were building uh, in the Mazda plant in Flat Rock, Michigan. So they were going to rebadge a Mazda Probe, or a Ford Probe, 
that was built along the, the lines of the, some of the Mazda engineering. They came to me and asked me if I could help them very quickly uh, uh, put together uh, the engineering and the development program for a new Mustang. So we worked on that for, for about 30 months and uh, naturally it wasn't badged Roush, anything to do with Roush at the time. It was the ne just the next new Mustang. It was introduced in, in 94 and uh, uh, at the end of that process I had probably 30 cars that were going to get scrapped that had been development cars that couldn't be sold that were mild, mileage style and had done their, uh, their, their task as served their purpose for a, a development tool. And I looked at one of those cars and, I, and we had a design studio that was going that could make new faces and spoilers and things. And I looked at one of those cars and I said, save that car for me. I said to my guys, don't, don't, don't let them crash that car. I said, let's fix a Let's fix an exciting car that we'll use to put in our collection that would uh, remember the fact that we had something to do with this 94 Mustang that was real special. It's the biggest job that I ever had as an engineering uh, development prototype uh, uh, provider uh, job for Ford. And uh, so we spent about six months on the car. New fascia, rear fascia, new front fascia, side pipes, uh, new, new, uh, new rear spoiler, uh, all of which were unique uh, of tooling that we made ourselves and uh, put a NASCAR uh, crankshaft in it with a half inch more stroke so the five point the five liter engine went to 5.5 .5 liters which is uh, 340 some cubic inches and uh, and uh, anyway I was supposed to go pick it up and drive it for the first time after it was all finished and my CEO was there uh, he met me at the door and says Jack I got good news and bad news for you so I said what's the good news he says well the good news Ford's real interested in in your car and some of the dealers uh, saw some pictures that we provided him of, of this of this uh, personalized Jack Roush car and uh, the bad news is that we've given it back to Ford to pass around he said we don't know when you're going to get to see the, your car <laughs> so I, I didn't get to see it for about 18 months mm -hmm. but that was that was Roush Performance Products Mustang number one Mm -hmm. And we're probably something over 10,000 Mustangs by this point. Mustang owners, enthusiasts, and admirers are the reason the tale of the original pony car isn't a cold, sterile affidavit about a transportation tool, but is a warm, inviting, and emotional testimony about a mobile apparatus that is more like a family member than a car. When um, I had just graduated from Chicago Teachers College, and I needed transportation to get to my new job in the suburbs. I was living at home in Chicago, and Mom and Dad and I went looking for a new convertible for me. So I told the salesman when we walked into Johnson Ford on Cicero Avenue in Chicago, I said, I want a convertible. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I don't have any convertibles on the floor. But follow me in the back. I have something special to show you. And in the back, under the tarp, was a skylight blue convertible, and I was all excited. I said, oh, yes, that's for me, because the cars back then were all, you know, boxy. And here was a sporty car, it had bucket seats, and it went zoom, zoom. And yeah. I was excited. I said, oh, yes, I want that car. And it was Wednesday, April 15, 1964, two days before Lee Iacocca was unveiling the Mustang at the New York World's Fair. So the salesman said, I'm really not supposed to sell it tonight. But for some reason, he did sell it to me. <laughs> I paid $3,447.50. And I didn't realize what I had bought till I drove it out of the showroom. And I got on the street, and everybody was waving at me, giving me high fives, asking me to slow down so they could look at this car. So I felt like a movie star. I was 22, I was single. <laughs> But it was the car, it wasn't me, it was the car they were all excited about. So the next day when I drove it to school, there's a junior high attached to the grammar school. So all these seventh and eighth grade boys came out and they were just hovering over the car. And the custodian was saying, Miss Brown, if I had a nickel for everybody that looks at your car, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> and that's how it was for quite a while when I was driving that car, it was very popular. My name is Jeremy Davis, I'm from London, England and I'm here for the 50th anniversary celebrations. My car is a 1966 convertible with the V8 engine and the, uh, an AOD gearbox. And I shipped my car from England to Los Angeles to take part in the Mustangs Across America drive. So this car has gone across the ocean from London, through the Panama Canal, 
up past Mexico all the way to Los Angeles and she started the drive in Corona. And for seven days we uh, fought our way through weather and dust storms and Texas oil fields and we made it to Charlotte and uh, here we are enjoying the, uh, this incredible event. On Monday the car gets shipped back to uh, England. It goes to Charleston, put on a boat and then back to the UK. I was a 17-year-old graduating from high school, Poland, Ohio, a little tiny town. Came home from graduation that night, and there was a brand new Mustang in the driveway. My mother did not know about it. My dad bought it. It was a Prairie Bronze Coupe, the only one that was available in Youngstown, Ohio that day in a showroom. He bought it in a little town called Struthers, Ohio. And I always tell people, well, if it had been a red convertible, that's what I would have had. <laughs> but I got a Prairie Bronze. I left for Ohio State right after that. I spent four years at Ohio State, and that little car, it flew. I could get from Youngstown, Ohio to Columbus in about two and a half hours. <laughs> and believe me, it was exciting. So that was my car story. And then I always tell people my mother bought me a watch. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Miller, like Gail Wise, has never traded or sold her prized Mustang. In this day and age, it's unusual for a buyer to retain ownership of a car for more than 10 years, let alone 50. Knowing how rare and special this is, Kathy created the original owners group and gathered several members who have owned their Mustangs for five decades at the celebration in Charlotte. And there was the president of Ford, the CEO, Alan Mulally. And Ford had just been the only manufacturing company that did not take government money. So we were pretty pleased with him. So he's up there speaking, introducing, welcoming all of us to the Mustang show. So I had a hat with me and I had a shirt and I thought, I'm, I'm just going up there and giving him one. So as he got that speaking, and I'm sure the president of the MCA wasn't too thrilled with me that day, I just walked right over and I told him who I was as he finished his presentation. I said, could you come meet all of our original owners that are here? Well, he was a gentleman and he did. We each had our picture taken with the president, or the CEO, I guess he is, CFO, CFO, C CEO. So he came by, you know, we have, each of us had our picture taken with him. He looked at our cars, admired our cars, and we had a wonderful time. So I thought, we have to continue this. This is important to people who have owned and loved their cars forever. So the goal then was to try to get more people for the 50th anniversary, because this was really an important one. My name is uh, Barry, and it's my wife Gail Featherstone, and we're from Hamilton, New Zealand. And we're here for the 50th. We spend a lot of time in the U.S. anyway over the past few years, and but the main objective of this was to be here at the 50th, as we own several Mustangs in New Zealand, and we wanted to be a part of the celebration. So it's been a long wait. We did the 40th in 2004, 45th in Birmingham, and now here we are in the granddaddy of them all, Charlotte, North Carolina. My name is Mano Berendonk. I'm from the Netherlands. I fly over for eight days. I own a Mustang, 1995 convertible, uh, GT, all in original condition with very low mileage. I'm here in Charlotte to, see, uh, to, to celebrate the 50 years Mustang. My name is Marco Mulder, I'm also from the Netherlands, and I own a 65 convertible. Hello, this is Reinhard, and this is Olga, and this is Hello. Miller, and we all three are from Germany. And uh, we appreciate uh, it so much to be here and uh, to stay with you. And uh, it's such a big pleasure that I even volunteered for a few hours here, you, you know, um, just to help this big effort all people uh, doing here. Myself um, own uh, two Mustangs, two classic ones from 67, a fastback, Wimbledon white, mint condition, but um, a 68 convertible in a miserable condition. So one is too good and one is too bad to ship it over here to the States. And uh, anyway, we are, we are so pleased to be here and thank you for all. Hi, um, I'm George, I'm from Belgium, and uh, I own a 67 Fastback Mustang. Uh, I've owned it for three years. I, uh, I was always passionate about it uh, since I was, 
I know young. I, I've always seen it in movies and, and heard about it and read about it, seen it everywhere. And, and you know, it's a passion that kind of grows on you. So in the end, you you end up liking it so much that you can't go without thinking of it. <laughs> you just want to own one. And then in the end, we found one after looking for quite quite a while. We found one um, in Germany that was uh, just imported from. Um, from the United States and it was in good shape and it just uh, was perfect so uh, you know it was too hard to resist <laughs> and um, and I've had it for three years and uh, it's it's very nice uh, to own it's uh, it's a really reliable car I've had no problems with it so far and it's great to drive it's different than, than new cars it's uh, it's um, more raw, you got the sound, you, you got you know a bit of rattle here and there maybe, but that's you know it's part of the old old car, um, uh, and it's just generally very nice to drive, and you get a lot of positive reactions from people, uh, smiles, people who point, people who ask questions about the car. Um, it's uh, it's it's an international passion I think for Mustangs. I'm Charles Bosford from Bonnie Lake, Washington. I have a 1976 Mustang II. Uh, I was doing a Mustangs across America. Uh, when we reached uh, Dallas, Texas, the rear end on the car broke in two when I was doing about 80 on the highway. Uh, it took me uh, four days to get the car repaired, and then from there, it took me one day to get from Dallas to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. My name is Holly Clark. My dad was Bill Clark. He's best known for the running horse design. I was up in the attic at my grandmother's looking for some Christmas stuff and I found all this Mustang stuff that said Mustang on it and a bunch of Ford things. I didn't find out all this until the 80s and when I did, I didn't know what I'd found. Now, this must be important so I started contacting Ford people and I got a letter back. He worked on that team like in a spook works kind of thing. It was all like undercover stuff. So anyway, it's real exciting to be a part of this Mustang family. It's, it's like going back to college and participating with everybody. Really enjoying it and being part of this 50 years and the spirit of dad lives on the Mustang still running wild and free. I'm Jimmy Bruno. This is my wife Barbara and my daughter Tracy and we're from New Orleans. I bought my first Mustang with my own money for $725 in 1971. It was a 1966 coupe, white with red interior. It was beautiful. Um, I had to buy a Mustang because I was one of six kids and most of us had Mustangs because that was a car that my dad could fix. It was easy to work on. He had a garage full of parts and it took me all the way through college and through my first two years of teaching at which point I married my husband and he made me unfortunately sell my car. So about ten years ago I kept seeing Mustangs around classic Mustangs and I kept telling dad I really want a Mustang. I really want a Mustang. So we got in touch with his friend who knows all about Mustangs. We found one for sale through him. And it was a white 66 GT Coupe with red interior, just like Mom's. So Dad said, all right, the only way we can buy it is if we tell Mom that we bought it to replace hers. So we did. And um, it survived Katrina inside of a garage up high enough. And so since then, we've taken it to car shows. That's our special thing to do. We've rebuilt it from the heads up. And we drove it all the way from New Orleans, almost 800 miles, to be here for the 50th celebration of the Mustang. The 50th anniversary celebration had the look and feel of a huge family reunion. One of those reunions where everything came together, and practically everyone was able to attend. Your nephew, Junior, who now has a driver's license and his own car that he constantly has to replace the retires on. Uncle John who has retired from motorsports and is now restoring Mustang engines and transmissions. Your spicy cousins from Italy, who you got to meet for the first time. A reunion so strong that even a day of rain couldn't dampen anyone's enthusiasm.
everyone showing off their prize stings, then disappearing off for joy rides around the place. What kind of reunion would it be without lots and lots of pictures? The week-long celebration was filled with special, once-in-a-lifetime moments. Three automotive superstars in one place casually talking. A kid watching Mustangs parade by in the rain. And these special moments. Uh, my father worked um, in Dearborn uh, with the prototypes. And um, I have a, an artifact that I brought today. Oh, yeah. And there's... There's a good story, and maybe you know it, and you may have known my father, but when they made the emblems, and they had the Cougar one first, he, he dealt with prototypes and the body engineering. There's Ford part numbers and everything on here. That They had the running horse, and it was running in the- Wrong direction. No, it, it was on the right side of the car. It was one run in the wrong direction. So I have, my brother has the other pattern, my dad retired, that was, they were giving him, he used them as bookends on his desk. <laughs> engineering. And um, that is just the iconic symbol. And, and I happen to have the one that's running the other way and it was used as a part number on it. It says medallion front fender right hand side. Oh, really? that, that is mm -hmm. one of the original patterns. Let me have that just a minute. Let me tell you a, a, a true story. We didn't get the name change until the very, very last minute. And we had to take that cat out of that grill. <laughs> and we had to design the horse. We didn't have time to do it in metal or even in clay. So we had one of our sculptures carve it in wood. We took the wood model and chrome plated it and put it in the car. <laughs> I was going uh, down I-75 uh, and uh, going through uh, just south of Lexington, Kentucky, on my way to my to my wife's. Uh, we were married uh, right out of school. My wife's uh, family and a cop, a policeman pulled me over and he told me that I, it was, I, I was outclassing the traffic. And I thought it was a compliment. I thought he was complimenting on my car. He meant that I was driving too fast. <laughs> I never remember, I never forget the, uh, the expression on his face when I, when I thanked him. But I just want to thank you for designing the best car in the world. <laughs> thank you very much. Who buy a car just to do, get them from point A to point B. And, and for, for, the, for them, they're not Mustang owners. They're the generally your Mustang owners, we know how you are. You're the ones, you have a name for your car, don't you? You named it, right? And when you turn your Mustang off, you don't just turn it off and walk away. You stop, 
you look back, don't you? And then there's something going through your head. You're going, oh, you look at it differently. You're not normal. Okay. Acting like the universal translator upon the Starship Enterprise, the emotion, pride, thrill, joy, love, and drive that is spurred on by the Ford Mustang translates in any language and is understood by everyone. La Mustang è tutta la nostra vita, è una passione infinita, non, non ne possiamo più fare a meno. Abbiamo un grande club in Italia di appassionati e siamo tantissimi. Viva il Mustang Club of Italy! Vai, Jaime, Mustang, vive vero! Ich liebe es, die Mustangs über die deutsche Autobahn zu fahren. Also die Leute drehen sich immer um und gucken und applaudieren. Passion internationale, qui est partout dans le monde. Euh, C'est un design qui, est, qui, qui que tout le monde aime, qui attire. Euh, enfin, C'est attrayant pour tout le monde. We love the Mustang! The Mustang has brought people from all ages, races, and places together for 50 years. Enthusiasts who finally recall their stories about the Mustang. Now that Ford prepares to take the Mustang into its sixth decade, tell us your story. Like some reunions, there is news of the loss of a family member. And sadly, this reunion was no different. Alan Summer of Brazil loved his family and friends. He loved to travel. He also loved the Mustang. It was no surprise that Alan and his friends traveled from Brazil to Charlotte to attend the big 50th celebration. Sadly, Alan passed away while in Charlotte from a brain aneurysm. Here are a few words from Alan's friends. É, nós somos a delegação brasileira de, do, do Clube do Mustang e meu nome é Davi Bessa Alves. Eu sou o Caio Braga. Eu sou o Kleber Zagato Cristianini, de Bauru. Sou do Rio de Janeiro e Curitiba. De Bauru também. E viemos representar o Brasil 
no evento dos 50 anos do Mustang. Gostaríamos de agradecer pela organização que o Alan fez para a gente, tudo que ele fez pela gente, que ele trouxe a gente até aqui, participou da carreata da Pony Drive junto com a gente. E foi uma pena o que ocorreu, o, que ocorreu, o falecimento dele ontem. É, e a, o que pode consolar um pouco a família, que a gente sente muito, mas a gente pensa que, mesmo sendo uma situação ruim, pelo menos ele, ele foi embora fazendo o que gostava, viajando. Ele tinha uma agência de viagem, então ele estava viajando aqui, se divertindo com a gente, no meio de um monte de carro, no meio de um monte de Mustang. Então a gente, a gente sente muito e a gente agradece muito pela, pelo que ele fez pela gente. Valeu, Alan. Já agradecemos o apoio e da, do Mustang Clube of America em se solidarizar com, com o que aconteceu com a delegação brasileira e agradecemos muito toda, toda a força que vocês deram para nós. Estava tudo ótimo, obrigado. Valeu, Alan. Valeu, Alan. Valeu. Valeu, Alan. Obrigado. Valeu.